Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled, Neighbor let her brat park in my driveway repeatedly. I could not go to work, I got him towed, they called the cops on me for stealing their car. Less than two years ago, my wife and I moved into our first house together. Before this, we lived in an apartment for several years after we got married. Now, we do not have kids of our own yet, so maybe I am a little biased, but it seems like some kids and parents these days are incredibly entitled and bratty. Our next door neighbors and their son especially were extremely entitled. The story starts shortly after we moved in. For starters, we had a decent-sized driveway, and it sat on the side of the house that was next to this particular neighbor. Mine and my wife's car could fit easily, and we could fit up to four cars. Our next-door neighbor was a small family, a husband and wife with their two sons. They had three cars in their driveway prior to us moving in. At first, this family was very friendly, and it seemed like we could get along great. As a matter of fact, my wife seemed excited to make new friends so quickly right after moving into the neighborhood. However, her excitement quickly diminished. About a month and a half after we moved in, the father from next door came knocking on our door. He had come over to tell us that his 16-year-old son had just gotten his first car, a huge Ford F350 truck. At first, I thought it was weird he come over just to tell us this. I mean, that is great and all. I remember my first car but my parents definitely did not go around the neighborhood telling everyone. Well, it quickly became obvious why he wanted to come over and tell us. He then asked us if his son could park his car in our driveway, as our driveway had a significant amount of space compared to theirs. While I enjoyed the company of these neighbors, I really did not want some chunky beefed up truck in my driveway. Not only that, but who asks that? In my own opinion, there was no reason why they could not park the truck in the garage or street. After I had told them no, that I was not really comfortable with that, the father started whining on my doorstep and was complaining that they did not have room in their driveway or garage. They should have thought about that before they bought the truck. How and why was that my problem? Well, he did not like this answer. He actually told me straight to my face that he should be able to park in my driveway. At this point, I was starting to get pissed off. Seriously, it was not my problem that he bought a truck that was too big to park anywhere. I told him this in response, and we will let us just say this was the end of friendly relationship, and the start of a going war. Several days later, I came home to find that huge white truck sitting in my driveway, blocking my wife's car. And my wife was actually standing on the porch next door, arguing with my neighbor. I had parked my own car on the street, as I did not want to block my wife's car in along with the truck. I immediately went up to my neighbor and asked him what the hell his problem was. I told him that technically he was trespassing, but he did not even seem to give shit. I really did not want any problems, and I found it extremely frustrating that these people were not respecting our rejection or our property. After a few minutes of pointless arguing, my wife and I headed back home, and we noticed that the son was leaving in his car. We waited until he left and brought out our garbage cans to block the driveway. Well, the next morning when we woke up, we had seen that the garbage cans were moved, and the truck was back in the driveway. I was so pissed off, that I almost took off and started a fight with that son of a witch right then and there. But, luckily for them my wife stopped me. The truck disappeared and few hours later, and I had gone over to another neighbor's house to tell them the story and see what we could do to get these assholes to stop parking in our driveway. Our neighborhood was actually a part of an HOA, which luckily for us the house was well maintained so they did not really bother us, ha ha. And this neighbor suggested we get the HOA involved to see what we could do. However, a few more days went by, and the truck was not in our driveway. I was actually gaining hope that they had just decided to stop being douchebags, but of course that was not the case. One Monday morning, my wife was getting ready for work when she saw that the truck was back in the driveway, blocking not just her car, but my car too. She could not even get out of the driveway to go to work. Frustrated and pissed off, I called the police, and within minutes, they were at our door. I explained to them the situation, and how my wife could not even go to work because her car was blocked in. 
Well, with the help of the police, we had called out a tow truck to remove the car from our driveway. Of course, while this was happening, both the father and son had come out causing a ruckus, screaming that we were stealing their car. Imagine having the balls to tell the police that we were stealing their car that was parked in our driveway, against our will? It has been over a year since this happened, and I am thankful to say that we have a good bond now with our other neighbors. The next door neighbors actually traded in the truck for a smaller version just months after, and I am assuming they would be sulking about it. We were able to file a trespassing report and document the whole incident, but we decided not to take it any further. We just wanted it in writing in case they behaved like this in the future. Although, I doubt they will because they have not spoken a word to us since then. Sometimes, being an asshole back is worth it. The next story is titled. I refused service to a rude guest that used cancer as an excuse to be rude. The location. Nights in and sleeps, somewhere in Wa State. I'm working the morning shift, and it's already busy as soon as I clock in at 7 a.m. Five minutes later, I get a call from a guest in room number 303. Upon answering, the guest explains that he wants to book a night in the same room and that he's going to be making a new reservation through a third party right now. Okay, I check our availability really quick, and I find that there's no available rooms for his room type, a single queen. However, there are two more double queen rooms available. As I was explaining the issue to him and as I was about to go through possible workarounds, he interrupted me. So, you're saying, I have to leave at 11 a.m. and I have to wait until 3 p.m. to get back into this very same room? He said, I'm still thinking about where the miscommunication occurred where he assumed that would be the case. I didn't even mention departure times in the conversation. His tone of voice was a blend of angry and entitled belittling towards me. The kind that sends you shaking, makes you think you got into trouble. I say, no, that's not what's going to happen. Let me explain. And the guest tells me the same thing. Repeats his phrase. So, I have to leave at 11, just to get into the same room later? I am paying for this new reservation, right now, he said. Same tone, but louder. He's just angry. With pretty much a sold out night, I'm tired of his antics already, and I've decided to pull the plug on him seeing as how he was making me emotional at this point. Yes, you'll leave at 11, just like you said, I state, and I hung up the phone. I didn't find his new reservation yet. A few minutes later, he calls the desk again. Can I get transferred to customer service? He asks. I'm just here at the front desk, you're going to have to call. The guest interrupts me. He kept repeating the question again, getting angrier and angrier before I could even answer. Can you transfer me to customer service? Can you transfer me to customer service? Can you transfer me? And then he hangs up on the conversation himself. At this point, this man is going absolutely loony. Definitely not good for the hotel. I figure I've already told him he checks out at 11 am, and I'll just make my notes about it in the meantime. About 20 minutes later, I get a call from our hotel customer support line. They reference the problem guest and ask me why I am making him check out at 11 am and then back in at 3 pm. Keep in mind the problem guest booked through a third party. No clue why he called the hotel's direct service desk. So, I explain myself. I tell the agent we are sold out tonight, and the guest was making grand assumptions that I have no control over. I reiterate that the guest is checking out at 11, but I am now refusing service to him due to his behavior. The customer service agent say they understand and that they'll explain this to the guest. We hang up amicably. Meanwhile, I find that the problem guest did indeed make a reservation. And already paid for double queen room from the third party that definitely wasn't his room type. Not good. I already refused service to the guest, so I'll have to call him. I do so. When he answers, I tell him that I've found his double queen reservation, and before I can tell him that I'm refusing service to him, he interrupted me again. Yeah, I booked that reservation. But I'll be staying in this room, and fuck off, he said. The phone clicked on my end. Oh boy. Well, it was about 9am at this point. The problem guest certainly had their room until 11am. But afterwards, I was getting him off property and then DNR'd. Do not rent. So, I waited, and I didn't have to wait long. The same guest comes down from his room. His hair was unkempt, and he was a tall and lanky looking 30 year old man. And he had the gall to ask me for a breakfast bag. He even introduced himself. By the way, I'm the guy from number 303, and I won't be leaving the room. I'm just here to get my breakfast bag, he said. I stifled a laugh. Oh okay, 
I'm not getting you a breakfast bag. I'm refusing service to you sir, I said. The problem guest just scoffed at me, repeated what I said under his breath, and then left without saying anything else. I was honestly surprised that he just left it at that. I thought that was probably the end of it. At least I officially told him about my intentions with him. That wasn't the end of it. I get another call from our hotel customer service asking why I wasn't giving this problem guest his breakfast bag. I told them pretty much the same thing, though I definitely added in the fact that the guest told me to F off and was harassing me with these calls. And as a result, I am refusing service to him. The agent understood but asked if there was anything we could do to resolve the conflict. I told them that I was willing to cancel and refund the problem guest's reservation if he contacts the third party about it. We hung up amicably. At this point, I bet I was on this dude's mind. After all, I didn't duck off and let him keep his room on a sold out night. I'm proven right, because about 30 minutes later he's at the front desk, lanky arms practically hugging the counter like an orangutan in a defensive posture. Hello Mr. Problem Guest, I say. Can we start over? He asks. I mull it over, but if he wants to parlay, he has to hear how he affected me first. I look him in the eyes, and I tell him point blank. I didn't appreciate your behavior towards me one bit this morning, I say. And then he starts saying things. I'm sorry if I was a little bit rude, but you were being just as bad. Did you know that I found out I contracted cancer yesterday? And then you do this to me, refusing service and breakfast, he says. Oh, so he's gaslighting me. I determine that he doesn't want to parley. So, I reply. You think that having cancer gives you the right to behave like you are towards me? I ask. The problem guest begins strafing as he's ranting at me. I haven't done anything rude towards you at all. He stated. I check the lobby, and it's empty besides us. You told me to duck off, I reply. I make sure to emphasize his words. He balks and mutters, before saying clearly. Yeah, I did. But I'm just trying to stay here a bit longer because I have cancer. Would you really kick out a person for contracting cancer? Jesus, this guy was putting me on the spot. Oh well, consistency is key. Yes, I'm refusing service to you specifically for your behavior. We don't have any rooms for you anymore, I say. I'm going to be on the street because of you. He yells. I switch the conversation slightly. Don't worry about that Mr. Problem Guest. I have no problems in cancelling your reservation you just made. However, you have to contact the third party you paid and tell them about the situation so you can be refunded, I say. But it's a non-refundable reservation, I won't get my money back, he says. Oh, trust me, you will. As long as you contact the third party and have them contact me, you will, I say. With that, he went back to his room. The problem guest bothered me no more. I got a call from his third party and got the idiot his refund. He left the room in good condition, and I think he left at the side entrance because I never saw him again. He started with a bang and ended with a whimper. For my own work life, it's not worth arguing and placating people like this guy. Especially on a night that I know his room will be sold soon anyway. The thing is, he probably would have gotten his wish if he wasn't so mean. I would have just switched one of our pending single queen room reservations into a double room so Mr. Problem Guest could stay in the same room. But no, he had to assume that he was ducked from the get-go and try to make me feel bad about the specific circumstances of doing my job. Because he had cancer, I guess. The last story is titled. I got revenge on my neighbor, and he still has no idea I even did anything to him. My neighbor from a couple of doors down and I had a long-running feud. It all started when his dog came into my backyard, and my dog attacked it. I was nearby, and able to call my dog off before it got serious, but the other dog had a couple of bite wounds. The neighbor wanted me to pay the vet bill. When he threatened me with a lawsuit, I offered to pay half, even though I owed him nothing, it was his dog that was off the leash and in my yard, after all. He declined the offer, took me to small claims court, and lost. The trial lasted all of three minutes when the judge found in my favor. That set into motion him starting to fuck with me on a regular basis. My garbage cans would get knocked over every trash day. He would honk his horn and flip me off if he drove by my house. He tried to get my 10-year-old son arrested for riding another neighbor's minibike, never called the cops on their kids, just mine. It was all stupid petty crap. But it was a lot of stupid petty crap, and we were growing frustrated and mildly concerned what he might do. We eventually grew tired of it and filed a restraining order against him. 
We dropped the legal case against him when we received a letter from his lawyer stating that he would refrain from any sort of contact with any of my family for a period of two years. Things settled down at that point. But I was not yet satisfied. I had been staying on the high road through all of this, not responding to any of his BS in any way. I had a desire to get revenge, but never acted on it. Then one day, I hatched my plan of evil genius. I was in the hardware store, and I noticed some Japanese beetle traps. These traps are just a plastic bag with a scent pack. The beetles are drawn to the scent, fall in the bag, and can't get out. They also sold refill packages of the scent packs only, four per package. My neighbor has a very large rose garden in his front lawn. It is his pride and joy. Japanese beetles love roses. So, I bought four packages of the refill packs. The scent pack is a waxy substance in a shallow plastic cup. I put the packs in the freezer overnight, to allow me to pull the wax out easily. The next morning, I woke up at 3 am. I popped the wax squares out of their cups and put them in a baggie. Then I crept over to my neighbor's house and spread the wax squares in the mulch under his rose garden, covering them from view with a bit of the hardwood mulch. That day was a hot one. By 11 am it was north of 90 degrees F I figured the wax had probably melted into the dark mulch. Also, by 11 am, the Japanese beetles were starting to arrive at my neighbor's roses. I went on a bike ride later in the evening and could see a small swarm of them attacking the roses. My neighbor had not yet noticed what was happening. By noon the next day, there was a freaking cloud of them. There had to be hundreds, if not thousands. My neighbor noticed. That afternoon, I could see him spraying them and spreading seven powder and waving his arms in the air in frustration. By the third day, there were thousands of the beetles, if not tens of thousands. They were everywhere in his front lawn and wreaking havoc on his roses. By the end fourth day, there was nothing left of his rose garden, other than a few tattered leaves and the thorny stalks. Those damned scent packs must have drawn every Japanese beetle in for miles around. I had never seen so many in a single place. And that was it. The deed was done, and I was satisfied and laughing. Quietly to myself but laughing and laughing. And I never told a soul what I did, not even my wife. This was a few years ago, and his rose garden is fully recovered now. And it will stay beautiful so long as he keeps being a quiet neighbor. Thank you for listening.